Tell you what, Vince Gale don't have nothing on our song director, does he? I don't know where to start after that. Take your Bibles and turn to Luke chapter 7. You know, we talk about God's amazing grace. We sing about God's amazing grace. But tonight, I want to share with you a message about an amazing faith. You know, God's grace is amazing. Our faith in God ought to be amazing too. Our faith in Jesus ought to be something that Jesus, like it says in the Scripture here, when Jesus saw this man's faith, He marveled at His faith. He was amazed at His faith. 
In Luke chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, it says, Now when he had ended all of his sayings in the audience of the people, had entered unto Capernaum, and a certain centurion servant who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. When he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought him instantly, saying, that he was worthy for whom he should do this. For he loveth our nation, and hath built us a synagogue. Then Jesus went with them, and when he was now not far from the house, the centurion sent friends to him, saying unto him, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou shouldest enter under my roof. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee, but say a word, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man set under authority, having under me soldiers. And I say unto one, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him. And he turned him about, and said unto the people that followed him, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And they that were sent returned to the house, found the servant whole that had been sick. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we ask your blessings upon the reading of your word tonight. And Father, as we look into this centurion's faith tonight, help us to see the components that made up this amazing faith. So Father, our faith in you can grow and grow and grow till it's something that you can marvel at. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know, faith is not believing that God can do something. Faith is knowing that God's going to do it. It's one thing to believe that God can do something. It's another thing to have faith to believe that God's going to do everything He says He's going to do. Faith does not doubt. Faith does not get discouraged. And faith believes that all things are possible with God. Nothing is impossible to God. That's faith. Walking by faith means that we trust in God for the things that we can't see with these earthly eyes that He's given us. Faith will allow God to do for us and with us what you and I could never ever do all by ourselves. In Luke chapter 7, verse 1 to 10, there's a centurion soldier. And this centurion soldier had an understanding of who Jesus Christ was and is. And this story is important for a lot of reasons. But it's important tonight because it tells of a man who was a Gentile. And that's important. And I'll tell you why that's so important in just a minute. But this is a story that tells of a Gentile who put faith, not just faith, an amazing faith, a faith that Jesus marveled at. This Gentile put his faith in Jesus, who was a Jew, to the point that Jesus said, Man, that guy's faith is amazing. I don't know whether you realize this or not, but only twice in all of the Scripture does it say that Jesus was marveled about something or He was amazed about something. And this is one of those two times. The other time that Jesus was, was amazed at something was when Jesus began His public ministry. And you remember where He began His public ministry? He went to His hometown went to his hometown in Nazareth. Remember what the Bible says? It says that he was rejected by his fellow Jews. And when Jesus saw how he was rejected in his own hometown, the Bible says that Jesus was amazed by their lack of faith. So only two times did Jesus use the word marvel or amazed. One time he marveled at this man's great faith, Another time, he was amazed at a lack of faith. 
Why was Jesus so amazed at this centurion soldier? What was it about his faith that set him apart from anybody else? Well, number one, we see in the Scripture that it was his faith that caught the attention of Jesus because this man's faith crossed barriers. Remember, he was a Gentile. Jesus was a Jew. It says in verse 1 and 2, Now when he had ended all of his sayings in the audience of Capernaum, he entered or into the people, he entered into Capernaum, and a certain centurion soldier who was dear unto him was sick and ready to die. As Jesus entered into Capernaum, he was approached not by this Roman centurion soldier, he was approached by some representatives of this centurion soldier. And it seems that this soldier had a servant who was sick. Now that right there speaks a lot. He didn't sin for Jesus because he had a family member that was sick. He sent for Jesus because he had a servant, a slave who was sick. So evidently this was a man that the centurion cared about. And he was willing to cross racial barriers, ethnic barriers, when he as a Gentile appeared or appealed to a Jew for help. This man loved people. He loved people that were just not like him. You know, it's hard for people to love other people that are not like them. Isn't that true? You know, we want, we want to be around people who are, who are like us. But here was a centurion soldier who had hundreds of soldiers under him. And he had slaves. But he cared about his servants. He, cared, he probably cared about his soldiers. He cared about everybody. And it, it was not that he believed that Jesus could heal his servant, but this centurion decides, hey, I'm going to take a risk. I'm going to risk my reputation. I'm going to risk what other people think about me because I'm going to go and I'm going to ask Jesus for help for my servant. It was amazing faith that caused this man to be excited and to be a part of what God was doing. Look in verses 3 through 5. And when he heard of Jesus, he sent unto him the elders of the Jews, beseeching him that he would come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they besought Him instantly, saying that He was worthy for whom He should do this. Now listen to what it says. This is why the elders of the Jews thought this centurion was worthy of Jesus' help. It says, For He loveth our nation, and He built us a synagogue. Did you hear what the elders said? He said, He loves His nation, loves His people. Loves his country. And beside that, he helped build us a synagogue. He helped build us a church. This was a a centurion that had a big heart. He not only cared about his servant who was sick, but he also cared about a place for Gentiles to go to church. Jewish elders back in those days didn't have a whole lot of love for Romans. And they didn't have a whole lot of love for Roman soldiers in particular. But these Jewish elders went to Jesus and said, here is a Gentile who is a Roman soldier who is worthy for you to come to his house. Because this man's different. This man's unique. This man is so different that these Jewish elders were willing to go to Jesus and beseech Him on behalf of a Gentile to come to this Gentile's house. And the elders not only brought this man's request to Jesus, but did you hear what they were doing? They were vouching for Him. They were vow- They said, this is a good man. He may be a Gentile. He may be a Roman soldier. But this is a good man. He is our friend. And they argue that He's a man of integrity. That He's well liked by the Jews and by the Gentiles. 
And Jesus, He's worthy. He's worthy for you to come to His house and help Him. And look in verse 5. He loveth our nation, and He hath built us a synagogue. This man evidently had given a lot of money to help build a place of worship. Now back then, the Gentiles were barred from the temple in Jerusalem. They couldn't go into the temple and worship like everybody else. So they had to go to the synagogue to worship. The synagogue was a place that the Gentiles could come and listen to the Word of God being taught. And this Gentile centurion chose to get involved in what God was doing, even to the point that he was willing to give so that a synagogue could be built so Gentiles would have a place to go worship. He had a big heart. Some of you may have heard this story before. There's a preacher sitting in his office one day, and the telephone rang, and he answered it and said, Hello, can I help you? And a man on the other end said, this is agent so-and-so from the Internal Revenue Service. And the preacher said, well, how can I help you? He said, I got a question about one of your church members. He said, I was going over your church member's tax return for this past year, and I noticed that he gave $50,000 to the church. And the pastor said, well, I don't know if that's true or not. He said, I'd have to get with our bookkeeper and, and ask him and said, How how soon do you need this information? He said, I need it just as soon as you can get it. And the pastor thought for a minute, and he said, well, let me make a couple of calls. And he said, if you'll call me back tomorrow, I'll know for sure that he gave $50,000. Now think about that. What that pastor was going to do, he's going to call that guy. Internal Revenue's on the phone. They say you gave $50,000. Did you give $50,000? If you didn't, you better give the church $50,000 because I've got to call them tomorrow and tell them whether you gave $50,000 or not. Folks, hopefully we give to the church because we recognize that it's according to God's Word that we give. We give because it's through the church that this world is going to be evangelized. It's through the church that lost people are going to be saved. It's through the church that a lost world is going to be reached. That's why God wants us to give our tithe, but that's why God also wants us to give an offering which is above the tithe. Let me ask you something. These elders came to Jesus and said, we want to vouch for this Gentile. Now they were Jews. They were Jewish elders. And they came and they said, we want to vouch for this Gentile centurion. He's a good man. Let me tell you what he's done. (coughs) And Jesus had already heard what a big heart he had because this man was coming because one of his servants was sick. But he heard that he'd given to build a church and he was heard how he had loved his country. Let me ask you something tonight, church. What is it that God is doing that you're excited about tonight? Are you excited about anything God's doing? Folks, we ought to be excited about what God's doing. And some of you say, well, what is God doing? If you have to ask what God's doing, I feel sorry for you. Folks, all you have to do is look around and you can see what God's doing. You can look around and you can see what God's doing in this church. You can look around and you can see where people have been saved and people are joining the church and how the bus ministry is growing and, and, and how our youth ministry is growing. And you can look around and see it, our, our music program. You can just look around and see God working in all different areas of the church. What is it that God is doing that you're excited about? And you ought to be excited about what God's doing in your life and in this church. Then look in verses 6 and (coughs) 7. This man's amazing faith was so amazing that it caused him to approach Jesus Christ. Folks, when you have faith to believe, you don't care to approach Jesus. You don't care to call upon Jesus. Verse 6 and 7 says, Then when Jesus went with them, He went with the elders, And now he was not far off from the house. And the centurion sent friends to him, saying, Lord, trouble not thyself, for I am not worthy that thou should enter into my roof. Wherefore neither thought I myself worthy to come unto thee. 
but say a word, and my servant shall be healed. We see this man's love, but we also see his humility. This passage gives us two important components of a Christian faith. Number one, you've got to understand who Jesus is. And number two, you've got to have an understanding of who we are in relation to Jesus. In verses 6 and 7, before Jesus could ever get to this centurion's house, He sent some more representatives out. And He said, Jesus, it's not necessary for you to come to my house. Did you understand why He said that to Jesus? He did not want to put Jesus in a position of having to enter into the home of a Gentile. Don't come to my house. It's not necessary for you to come to my house. Not only was this Roman soldier loving, but he was also humble. He regarded himself as undeserving of Jesus and Jesus coming under his roof. And he didn't even think he was worthy enough to meet Jesus out in the street. So he sent representatives to say, Jesus, don't come to my house. I'm not worthy. This soldier, unlike the Pharisees, you know, the Pharisees said, Lord, give us a sign that will tell us who you are. This man didn't even ask to meet him. This man's faith was so great, he just said, Lord, just say the word. That's all you got to do, Lord. Say the word. Verse number 7, last part. But say a word and my servant shall be healed. And his faith was so amazing that he just said, Lord, all you got to do, Lord, you don't need to come. Just say the word. This centurion realized that Jesus held the power of life and death in his hand. And all he had to do to heal is say a word. Folks, it's still the same way today. All he has to do is say a word. He's still in the healing business. If Jesus was God in the flesh, then this Roman soldier was a Gentile sinner. And he was unworthy to meet Jesus. All Jesus had to do, say the word. And God's going to do it. Say the word. It's good as done. Jesus promised a special blessing on people like this centurion. When Jesus appeared to Thomas, <coughs> you know, Thomas doubted whether or not Jesus was alive. And when he appeared to Thomas, all of Thomas's doubts were removed. And you remember what he said to Thomas? He said, Blessed are they which have not seen, but yet believe. See, Thomas had to see before he had believed. And he said to Thomas, Blessed are they that don't have to see with their own eyes, but still believe. That blessing is still given to every one of us today, folks. And if this Roman soldier had that kind of faith in Jesus without ever meeting Him, how much greater you and I faith ought to be today in Jesus Christ. And in verse number 9, there's the reaction of Jesus. It said, When Jesus heard these things, He marveled at Him. He turned about, said unto the people that followed Him, I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. He said, I've never seen a faith like this. This man is an example of an amazing faith. And then almost as an afterthought. Luke adds in verse number 10, And oh, by the way, oh, by the way, those who were sent came back to the house. And when they got to the house, the servant who had been sick was well. Oh, by the way, look what Jesus did. Didn't even come to the house. What impressed Jesus was the characteristics of this centurion's faith. And this is the same characteristics that any of us can have tonight. You know, some think that you've got to have an amazing faith that's so amazing that you're able to do miracles. Folks, God's the only one who can do miracles. 
Miracles are something that Jesus can do anytime He wants to do. Look around in this place tonight. You see some miracles sitting here. But there are still those Christians in the world today whose lives are so faithful that their faith would impress Jesus. And Jesus would turn around and say, look at that faith. That's an amazing faith. A faith that's amazing is a faith that crosses barriers. You and I are supposed to love everybody. We're supposed to love even those who hate us. We're supposed to even love those who are mean to us. And an amazing faith will cause you to get excited about what God's doing and not just get excited about it, but want to be a part of what God's doing. I guarantee you, if you ever went out and you witnessed to somebody and that person was saved, you'd get excited and you'd want to go tell somebody else. You know why people aren't excited about souls being saved? Because they've never seen a soul saved. They've never witnessed anybody. When you get active in what God's doing, you want to be a part of it. And you want more and more of it. And then if you have an amazing faith, it causes you to come to Jesus in humility. And say, Lord, I'm not worthy of your presence. I'm not worthy of even being saved. Lord, I'm not worthy. But Lord, I want to thank you for loving me anyway. And it causes you to be willing to trust Jesus and trust Jesus alone. I'm sure you all have heard this story. It's, a, it's, a, it's an old illustration. But this guy was walking through the woods one night, and it was getting dark, and he knew he was getting lost. And all of a sudden, he fell. And it seemed like he fell and fell and fell. But all of a sudden, just trying to grab for anything, he caught a hold of a branch sticking out of a rock wall. There was enough light for him to look and see that it was a long way to the top and it was an even longer way to the bottom. And that was a sheer rock cliff. No way he could get up, no way he could get down. So he held on to that branch for a few minutes and then he looked up and he said, is there anybody up there that can help me? In a few minutes, there was a voice that said, I'm here, and I can help you. And the guy said, thank goodness. What are you going to do to help me? And the voice came back and said, you're going to have to trust me and let go. And the guy thought for a minute, and he looked back up, and he said, is there anybody else up there that can help me? That's the way we are with God. God wants us to let go and trust Him. And when God says let go, we say, wait just a minute, God. Let me see if there's another way out of this. Let me see if there's anybody else that can help me. Let me see if there's anything that can be done. And Lord, if there's no other way, I'll come back. And I'll do what you tell me to do. <clears throat> Folks, we need to be obedient to God. And when God says let go and trust me, we need to let go and let God be God. And having a faith that lets Him do in our life what He wants us to do. Father, thank You for God's amazing grace. Thank You, Lord, for Your love. And we're not worthy of Your love. for We're not worthy of Your salvation. We're not even worthy of that place that you prepared for us in heaven. But I want to thank you that by the blood of Jesus, Lord, you make us worthy. You make us worthy to come into your presence. You make us worthy that we can put our faith and trust in you. You make us worthy so that one day we can stand before you in heaven. We can hear the Master say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in. Thank you tonight. Church, help us to get excited about what God's doing. And help us not to be excited, but help us to be involved in visitation, soul winning, teaching, singing, worshiping, 
doing all the things that God has called us to do in this church and in this world. God, thank you tonight for saving us. I pray tonight, there's one here tonight that's lost without Jesus. Tonight they'd be saved. And I know this is Sunday night, but God's still in this place. God's still speaking. His Spirit's still real. And if God's speaking to you tonight, whatever it is He's speaking, have ears to hear and a heart to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.